Hey coders, let's talk about cafeteria plates and bank lines. If you're already familiar with a container data structures called lists, you've created them using arrays or sequences of linked structures. The list enables us to group individual data elements and then once they're grouped we can work with them as a whole or as separate data elements. We're going to look at two new container structures, the stack and the queue. Both of them are built on the list foundation but what makes them unique is their access. Both the stack and the queue have specific and limited data access points which govern the way that they function in your programs. There are two terms that you need to be familiar with in order to understand these containers, LIFO and FIFO. LIFO and FIFO are acronyms. They stand for last in, first out, and first in, first out. A LIFO container only exposes the top element, that is the last one that was added to the list. All of the other elements are figuratively not visible. The FIFO container exposes two elements, the first and the last. We're going to call these when we're programming the front and the back. New elements are added to the list at the back and elements that we're going to work with are removed from the front of the list. Like the LIFO structure, all the other elements are not visible. With a fundamental understanding of how to code the basic list structures, writing up the functions that make up the stack and the QADT is pretty easy. Each of the structures has a handful of required operations that enable them to provide their specific functionality to your program. So let's go and take a look at them starting with the stack. The stack is a very simple programming structure. The primary rule that we need to keep in mind is that only the top element is visible. Even though as a programmer you know that you can address any of the other elements. When you build your ADT you want to provide those functions that the user can utilize uh, to, to insert the stack into their program. So you are only going to provide functions that touch the top element of the stack. You know, one of the first things we realize uh, when we begin playing solitaire on the computer is that the card that you want is usually the second one down, uh, but it's inaccessible to you. And in the same way, the data elements that are going to be in your stack are going to be equally uh, invisible to the rest of the program. Now the required functions to uh, implement a stack are very simple. We have push, pop, and top. Those are the three primary uh, stack functions. Push is the operation of placing a data element onto the stack. That is, when we put a add a new data item onto the stack, we push it down because the next element is going to go on top of that and push it down and push it down. When we want to retrieve a data element, we use the function named pop and that pulls the top element off the stack, actually physically removes it from the stack so that the one that is beneath it is now visible. Everything beneath the second and below is still invisible to the rest of the program. And finally the function top does basically the same thing. It provides a peek at what the value of the top element is uh, but it doesn't actually pop it off so it just shows us what's there and what's not. Now you see I have a function called empty stack that just tells me if the stack has no elements on it and init stack goes and processes or initializes this structure right here. This structure contains all of the data that I need to know in order to operate the stack and this is because I'm implementing it using a an array. 
Now, whether it's static or dynamic, it doesn't matter. I need to know the number of elements, and that'll be in count, the number of elements that are in the stack, the maximum number of elements that can, that can be on the stack, and we'll see down here I'm using a constant called max. And then top tells me which element is, uh, represents the top of the stack. Now, if you think of your array laying sideways, your zero element would be the bottom of the stack. It could be the top if you only have one element, but let's say you stack up three or four. The zero element is your bottom and is an invisible. The top of your stack is going to be the third element or the fourth element or, or however many you've put onto the stack. So let's run this program and I'll give you a little demo as to what the stack can do for you. Okay, this program, this demo program, checks for palindromes. And so I've, I've run in a bunch of strings here and we can test to see if they're palindromes. So let's hit, uh, what is that, tuna nut. And you see the way that the stack is set up. The very bottom of my stack is the T followed by the U uh, that's, that's down by the uh, uh, double line across the bottom there. So the bottom of the stack, those are not visible to the program. If I was to call the uh, show top function, it would uh, pass the T back to me. So now what I'm going to do, because I push them in as I read them, so T-U-N-A-N-U-T, if it's a palindrome, when I pop them off one at a time, it's going to tell me that it's a palindrome. So it's going to compare each element against its uh, counterpart. And so in this case, we see that it is a, a palindrome. So we'll test uh, wilderness walk. Now, obviously, we know that one's going to fail because the W uh, that starts it is not a W at the end of it, the K. So that's not a palindrome. Uh, Too far, Edna, we wander afoot. That's a palindrome. And a dog, a plan, a canal, a pagoda. Well, I already know in advance. That's a palindrome as well. So let's have a look at the code that makes this happen. Okay, the first thing I do is initialize that stack structure because I'm going to pass that stack structure back and forth to all my functions. So I set my count to zero, my top to minus one because the zero element would be a valid top. And uh, then I set the size of the stack. If I used a dynamic stack, I would pass whatever value the user gave to me and send that in here and initialize it. When I begin to push data elements onto the stack. I check first to make sure that it has not exceeded the maximum stack size. If it does, I pass a stack overflow. Otherwise, I simply push that element onto the stack and increment my counters, and then go back and get the next element, the next element, the next element. It's very simple. The pop is really just the opposite. I take my return value off and I decrement my values and then return that, that value back into uh, back to the calling functions. It's a very simple structure, uh, but it's very powerful, especially when you need to reverse something. When you take and push elements in in the order in which you get them, but then want to address them in exactly the opposite order, uh, that's what the stack enables you uh, to do very quickly. So when I put this program together, we run the menu up and then simply initialize the stack, push all the data elements onto the stack. Uh, I show it, which gives us a nice little cup shape there with the elements in it. And then test palindrome. Test palindrome basically calls the pop function over and over and over until the stack is empty. And when the stack is empty, it's checking each, uh, or before the stack is empty, it's checking each one of the elements against the string that we, that we pushed onto the stack. So one by one by one, we just run through the stack. So the stack's really simple. 
And implementing it's even simpler. You just need to push and pop, uh, provide those to the user so they can put elements into the stack and take elements off the stack. As long as you provide them with an ADT and tell them that's the only way that they can get to that data, that'll prevent them from trying to access those quote unquote invisible elements. Like the stack, the queue is used to model a limited access data structure. The queue is most often used in situations where there is a disparity in the feed and the processing rate. In other words, the the feed rate of the incoming data might outstrip the processing rate of that data as it comes off the other side. So a holding queue is needed. With that in mind, let's have a look at how this structure is put together. All right, just like the stack, the queue is a closed access data structure. The difference being we have two access points. We have a front and a back of the queue, or the top or the bottom, however you want to look at it. The two access functions that your ADT needs to provide are NQ, which uh, puts an element into the line or into the queue, and DEC, which removes items from the queue. And so if you picture a bank line, since that's the common example, a person at the front of the line gets decked, he gets taken off when the teller addresses him, and the last person who just came through the door gets enqueued, he gets placed at the back of the line. So remember FIFO, uh, we could also call it first come, first served. And uh, we we have NQ deck and then two items that are similar to top, front and rear, which give us a peek at what is contained at the extremes of the list, uh, but it doesn't remove the value. Now, whereas I built the stack demo based on an array, uh, I built this demo using a linked list. And so I have a node here define and then the payload is just called data, whatever data you want to contain in your queue. Um, and this allows me to grow and shrink and do all those great things uh, without worrying about managing the array at the same time. It also, um, because the linked list can only be addressed uh, from the, the root forward, then um, the user getting the ADT is not so tempted to try to address the invisible data elements or those elements that are inside the middle of the queue. So similar to the stack, uh, I call init queue, which establishes my um, basis for the list. It uh, sets my front and rear to null, so I have no pointers that are pointing to the first element. And then as soon as I get my first element, I enqueue it. So I add it to the list so long as memory can be allocated. And then that becomes the front. If my count is zero, meaning there's nothing, this is the first item on the list, that's also going to be the rear of the list. So there's only one person in line. Now I add and add and add and add and I build up a line and pretty soon I need to deck them, that is remove them. And so uh, once again I go in and I, I make sure it's not an empty list and if it's not an empty list I take the person at the front or the item at the front of the queue and I remove it and then delete that node from memory. Uh, I delete it after I have reset who's at the front of the list. So using linked list really kind of simplifies this if you can uh, keep track in your mind what it is you're trying to do. Now the front and the rear, all they do is go in, uh, use the uh, queue structure, uh, that, that is the node that contains the information about the linked list, and it goes in and reads the data element that is at the front uh, or the rear of the list. Now, one of the things that the queue is especially useful for 
is to be used when there is a difference in processing speed. That is, maybe data elements come in much faster than they can be processed. So uh, I'm modeling a print queue here. So I can send a million jobs to the print queue, um, but the printer, because it's a mechanical device, can only print X number of pages per, per minute. And so the queue sits in the middle of the print requests and the print operation itself. And it allows the printer to go to the queue, pull off a job without being jammed up by all of the other jobs that are coming in behind it. So let's uh, run this a little bit. So we add a job to the queue, add a job to the queue, add a job to the queue. And uh, so here's my queue right now. The front of my queue is job 8315, then 8318, then 8321 was the last one in. So if I add another one to the queue and display it, we see that 8364 got added back there. Now I haven't printed anything yet, so I'm going to print a job. And I printed the first job in the list. So now if I look at my queue, the front of the line is now 8318 uh, and 8364 continues to bring up the rear. And so the queue, again, just like the stack, it's a very simple uh, structure. It's very simple to program, but it has a lot of power. And I think if you become more familiar with this data structure, you're gonna find a lot of places that you can use this in your program. The stack and the queue are eminently useful constructs that should be a part of every programmer's toolbox. Each structure has unique aspects that make them useful for solving a wide variety of programming situations. When you become more familiar with them, I think you'll find that they make their way into a number of your designs. So let's have at it. Give the queue or the stack a try and see what new applications you can bring into the world. Good luck. I want, I want.